Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Construction Project Management Tips, where we work to manage our projects smarter, faster, and better. Today, we're going to be discussing the critical path method and how it works in construction. Some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages to the critical path method. So let's jump in. All right, so the critical path method, it's not something that's been around for hundreds of years or since the pyramids or anything like that. It's really only been around since the 1950s. It was part of a military sort of uh, project and Remington Rand, they kind of developed critical path method because they had a project that had like over 100,000 activities. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna need to computerize it. Well, of course, things evolved and it was quickly seen that critical path method could be used for any kind of project management from planning a wedding to planning a construction project. And as software tools advanced, so did the use of the critical path method. So I want you to think about the critical path method as being a complete network of activities. So that means, you know, if you have a series of activities like I have in this up here in the corner, then they get connected. And when they get connected, there's a bunch of calculations that take place. Now I go through the calculations in another video. I'll provide a link to that in the description. I'm also gonna be providing updates as I go along with my project management uh, channel, my construction information channel. Um, so please um, subscribe to my YouTube channel as we build this community and uh, click the notifications icon as well. Also, I welcome comments and ideas for future videos. But getting back to what we were talking about, the critical path method is a complete network of activities. Uh, we connect them based on what must happen before we start something and what needs to happen after we do something. And construction, think about it, you know, we have to have the roof substrate down before we put the roofing membrane on top of it. That has to be done before we do the next activity. So what it does is it forces you to lay out the project from beginning to end, which is really good to do in construction, right? Uh, it makes you think things through. It makes you come up with what you expect the durations to be for these activities. And you put them into a network and then if you're using a software program, this is examples with Microsoft Project, then it will calculate the actual start and finish dates based on the durations you put in. And then you can make adjustments, whatever you need to do, based on you know the subtrades, et cetera, coming into your project. But it will calculate then the longest path through the network. And that longest path through the network, that will become basically your critical path. The ones that are in blue here, they're not the longest path. They have some flexibility and we call that flexibility float. So that means it could take a little bit longer before it would become critical. Now the critical path doesn't stay the same when you run a project. It usually changes because something doesn't go the way that you planned. Well, then it would adjust. So for example, this rough in plumbing activity, I can tell because it's basically starting at the same time as rough in HVAC, which is on the critical pack, as well as rough in electrical install drywall first side. I can tell that it would have one day of float because it's going into the successor activity is this milestone inspection. So it has one day of flexibility. If it took one day longer, then you'd have two critical paths because both of them would be on the longest path through the project. If it took nine days instead of seven days, then it would push out my project finish date by one day. It would consume that float that we currently have of one day and it would drive out the project by another day, pushing all of these outward. And so that's a, a really good bit of information that I can see when I develop the critical path method. That's where it has so much value. It tells you key dates and it tells you impacts of various things that occur on your project so that you can better manage your project. You could say that it's the shortest time to complete the project based on your inputs. In other words, based on all these durations and the network that we put together, that finish date is the soonest that we can finish it. Unless we shorten something on the critical path, then we may be able to finish it earlier. 
like to my point earlier, I could shorten this by one day, this red item, and it would shorten my project by one day. If I shorten it by two days, it would still only shorten it by one day because this would become critical because this would now be on the longest path through the network. So hopefully that's making a little bit of sense to you of how the critical path works. I find that there's a lot of people that are involved in projects and they really, they have an idea, but conceptually it doesn't, all the parts don't fit together. So in this short video, I'm just trying to get you up to speed. I have many more videos that go into this in much more depth. Uh, you can see in this example here, when I say a network diagram, well, the bottom left corner here of your screen, that's a network diagram. So any kind of scheduling software like Primavera P6, Microsoft Project, will, when you create this Gantt chart, will be creating this network diagram. And the network diagram is actually the founding of where Critical Path came from. We had Gantt charts long before we had the Critical Path, maybe about 50, 60 years earlier. Henry S. Gantt invented it around 1910. But it didn't have the connections and the critical path calculations done. So in the background, the network diagram, which is the schedule logic of the connections, is doing all those calculations. I'll leave a link in the description that you can link on to another video where I show you how those calculations are actually um, done. You can see in red here, that is the critical path. You see this one is not connected. That's not good. It needs to be a complete network of activities. This should be connected to what makes sense. In this case, it makes sense to connect it to inspections like I have it up here. Um, so that's, that's an important element too when you develop the critical path. Fortunately, in scheduling software, when you develop it here, if I've got all the connections right here, they would all be the same here. They're intertwined. I can't have one being different than the other. They're, they talk to each other and uh, that's not a worry. I just showed this as an example of what happens when you don't have a complete network. So what are the advantages of the critical path? Well, going through all that work of listing out your activities and thinking about the logic, the sequencing, looking at the durations, what should come next? What should I wait for something? Can I start something before something? You put all that together, that will give you key phase dates, key milestone dates, and your overall finish for your project. Very valuable information when you're trying to figure out, is this possible? Uh, you can prioritize your work based on the CPM. You know, if I have something that has a relatively fair amount of slope, which installed drywall first side would have quite a few days of float, uh, I can, you know, prioritize other things. So if, if my drywall sub came up to me and said, oh, this is gonna take 10 days instead of six days, and if I had 10 days of float on this activity, then I wouldn't be sweating it too much. However, if my HVAC sub came up to me and said it's gonna take three days longer, I know my project's gonna take three days longer. I can prioritize based on the critical path. I can also look at, well, this is pretty close, so if my plumbing sub comes and says it's gonna take three days longer, I know that it's gonna delay my project by another two days. So it gives me good information that way. I can run sensitivity analysis. I can play around with the numbers because there's a lot of different paths and scenarios that can take place. It's pretty easy once you've structured it up into a schedule to try different scenarios, to vet questions, to look at impacts. So it's really helpful for that. And it reduces the stress as you know where there is some flexibility. Things that have float, I know where I've got flexibility. Things that don't, I know I've got to put that sort of Pareto principle into play, that 2080. I've got to focus in on these activities or else it's going to give me a pretty negative result. If I do focus in on them, I succeed. It's going to give me a pretty positive result. It can be updated pretty easily. As I said, you know, you can update. There's whole processes that are involved with that that helps you better manage your project. So it's foundationally very helpful. Provides that benchmark that you can compare, you can measure against. You know, it was Peter Drucker that said uh, in Management by Objectives, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Well, critical path, you can certainly measure it. Gives, it can give confidence for the project team. It can give a lot of confidence because you have things in order, you can track where you are, you can compare. So it gives a lot of confidence, not just to the project team, but to owners and the people that are interacting with the project team, uh, sub-trades, subcontractors. Disadvantages, it's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect. Uh, 
So one of the disadvantages is I could develop a master schedule for a big project and I could have all the time frames in there, but is it right to the trade partners that are involved in the work? So for example, if I go back here, you know, if I just came up with eight days, but I didn't really consult with that sub trade and the timing of it, they're probably not going to be in agreement with it. There's no buy-in to it. So just because I've got this schedule doesn't mean it's going to work, right? Um, so that that's a that's an important one to think about when we think about um, disadvantages. It can give you a false sense of confidence uh, because you know, I've got this wonderful schedule here and everything's going to run well. That doesn't mean it's going to run well. Um, you can make a mistake. It's like estimating. So when you enter the information, if you have a typo, you know, a lot of people that I, I train and I work with and I consult with, you know, it's not fair. I just, you know, missed this number here. Well, estimating is the same way, right? Uh, so you have to be pretty diligent. You have to have it reviewed carefully. But that's just the nature of the beast. Scope needs to be clear and transparent. So if, you are, if you're basing this schedule on uh, a set of drawings and specifications that has a lot of issues in it and mistakes and errors and gaps, well, every time something comes up, that's going to be uh, impacting your schedule. The good thing is, though, if you've been keeping a good schedule, you can show those impacts and then you can seek uh, relief in those cases. Falls out of date quickly. Needs to be updated on a very regular basis. Otherwise, you're not looking at the current information. Um, and often in construction projects, the last point here, there may not be proper engagement and communication between those working in the field. So I'm talking about like the trades themselves, like the four persons, and even to the site super. Uh, sometimes there's a dichotomy that takes place between the, the physical site team and the project manager who is really dealing a lot with the consultants and the owners. You have to make sure that there's a feedback loop mechanism in there. And so in traditional construction projects, we do have some issues running solely with the critical path. Now we alleviate that by having short-term look ahead schedules. And I personally, in the last uh, number of years have really sort of been waving the flag for lean construction methods, which really sort of takes this to another level with integration and engagement of people. But at the end of the day, I'm still at the highest level. You rewarded this project uh, based on a schedule of milestones, phase dates, and a finish date. And at that point in time, it's very difficult to have that kind of full engagement. So uh, critical path method allows you to get there. It allows you to see the critical activities, but there are other things that you need to do to have success on your project. But it is one of the tools that is kind of universal in project management. And we can take it to another level with other tools and other mechanisms that allow for better, more full engagement in your project. So I hope this gives you a clear understanding of the critical path. Like I said, I've got other, I'll put in the um, show notes, some other uh, descriptions and links to uh, some of my other discussions on critical path and I'll have more coming out. Um, so please click the subscribe uh, button. It helps uh, build this community and the notifications. And if you've got uh, other ideas or requests for uh, videos, please put them in the comments. I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.